Should I begin, Shruti? Yes, sure, ma'am. Okay, okay. Um, good afternoon, uh, everyone, and welcome to the Wednesday seminar of the Institute of Chinese Studies. I'm Ambika Vishwanath, the director and co-founder of Kuba9 Initiative. We are a geopolitical advisory and consultancy based in Mumbai. So in that sense, I say good afternoon, but good morning and good uh, evening to wherever you're tuning in from. Um, I'm a water security specialist and I work a lot on urban water and on transboundary water management. So it gives me great pleasure to be co-hosting this seminar with the, the ICS uh, that allows us to speak about these a variety of issues. Um, every Wednesday, they have a most fascinating seminar. Um, please, on on uh, I know I know we've all done a lot of these Zoom events and webinars, but it it uh, needs to be stated that uh, to please keep your mic on mute when you're not speaking. And if you have any questions for our panel members um, through the event, then you can put them in the chat box. Um, I would say raise your hand, but at this stage, I can't see all the, uh, the screens, so it's easier if you just put them in the chat box. Um, so our discussion this Wednesday is on transboundary effects of infrastructure development. Um, what does that mean exactly? Uh, now, rivers systems are managed differently in different countries. This is true uh, across the world and especially so in South Asia. Um, however, when you look at a region like South Asia and other regions where rivers are so intricately connected, then dam building, uh, water infrastructure, water diversion plans, um, and any other forms of infrastructure that we think of uh, threaten the stability of the entire river basin, uh, not just uh, in a country that it is being built in. So while their management is different in each country, we need to keep in mind what happens to downstream countries when we're building something in our country. Um, there is also in this region, and when I say this region, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking specifically of the Eastern Himalayan region where we have the Yalung Sangpo that leads into the Brahmaputra, that leads to the Meghna Basin. Um, there is very little sustained and meaningful discussion on joint water management. There's hardly any treaties and agreements. Um, and there is, um, at this stage, I would say probably little scope for uh, multilateral cooperation across the river between all the five countries that share. Um, so that is including Nepal and Bhutan. So uh, in that sense, to discuss all of these uh, very important issues, um, very relevant uh, today, especially given the last uh, couple of years and all the um, adverse effects from some of this infrastructure development that we've seen um, through the Himalayan region, uh, both in India and in other countries as well. I have a very amazing and stellar panel with me. Um, I am very happy to introduce, uh, and I'm just gonna go as I see them on the screen. So right next to me is um, Vishwa Rajan Sinha. He's the program officer, water and wetlands um, in the science and strategy group organization at IUCN, Asia, uh, the Asia regional office based in Bangkok. Then uh, next to him is Dr. Ruth Campbell, whom I'm very pleased to meet uh, for the first time uh, virtually. We've spoken quite a bit over the last few years. So this is very exciting for me because I've been following her work for a long time. Um, she's a lecturer in history at La Trobe University in Melbourne, Australia. She's a historian of Tibet and the Himalayas with a particular interest in this region and its rapidly changing environment. And she's currently writing a history of the Yalung Sangpo uh, River. So I'm very much looking forward to that. And next to Ruth is um, a very good friend of mine, uh, Mirza Zulfikar Rahman, who holds a PhD in development studies from the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, uh, Indian Institute of Technology in Gohati. And he is, if I may say, one of, I think, our foremost experts of that region uh, when it comes to looking at water, resources, people, livelihoods, development. And uh, above all, I think he's one of the most beautiful writers. Um, so if you haven't already read any of Mirza's work, you must. Um, so welcome, everyone. Um, welcome to all three of you. I'm going to start with one question that's a bit broad, 
Um, so it's going to come to all of our panel members. Um, our panel members are going to speak for maybe five to seven minutes based on this one um, broad question. We'll then I'll then go through a second round of questions, at which point then I will open up the discussion to the audience. So please put your questions in the chat box. Um, and so we can then have a little bit more interaction in that sense without it just being a discussion between me and the panel members as much as I would uh, like to just do that. Um, so. Uh, I'm going to start with you, Ruth, though the same question to you, Mirza, and to Vishwa as well. Um, I mean, it, it speaks to the, the, the title of this panel. Um, and if we think of the impacts of unplanned or un, of, of development in the, along the rivers, um, and not just dams, but any forms of development um, on both rivers and people, what are the impacts that we see nowadays? I mean, going beyond what we're hearing just in the news, what is likely to happen in the future, and how do we then balance out this need that we have for growth and development, um, and, uh, uh, and, and on the other side, how do we safeguard then the river and the people where this development is meant to benefit, but doesn't always uh, benefit in the long term. So um, Ruth is going to speak a little bit about Tibet. We're going to then go down the river to Mirza, who'll speak a little bit about um, the Brahmaputra, and then uh, down to the Meghna River um, from Vishwa. So Ruth, over to you. Yeah, hi, everyone. Um, I'm speaking to you tonight from the unceded lands of the Wiradjuri people of the Kulin Nation in Nam, which you also know as Melbourne. It's, the middle, it's not the middle of the night quite yet, but I just thought I'd like to acknowledge the um, elders of the land I'm on before I started talking. Um, so yeah, so to answer your question, um, I, 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 I wanted to show you one particular image that I found in um, the uh, China releases a five-year plan um, every five years. <laughs> um, and uh, um, the latest one that they released um, showed a map that I thought was super interesting. Um, to talk about the uh, development that they're going to do with uh, the that they're planning to do on the Brahmaputra River. Um, so this is actually two maps. One is from 2003 and points to, uh, has a point for all of the places where there's hydropower potential in uh, on the Tibetan in well in the People's Republic of China, including the Tibetan Plateau. And you'll see that it's all really concentrated at those points uh, in the geography or the topography where the rivers slide off the side of the Tibetan Plateau. But it's the one that is on my right, and I'm hoping it's your right as well, um, that I wanted to particularly bring your attention to. And this map it really speaks volumes to me because it looks at how they're basically going to be extracting energy and resources from the Tibetan Plateau and also from Xinjiang and Mongolia and sending it down into the area of China that is the that is called Nelu or the the inner area the 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 area that is like China proper for want of a better way of putting it uh, where most of the population live uh, and there's a uh, less minorities uh, and um, it, where cities and, and there's a great need for power um, so yeah so you get this I uh, the, the, this uh, map is showing what they're calling the clean energy transfer and it shows you how important the um, power that they're extracting from uh, the non-Han or non-Chinese areas of um, the People's Republic of China will be to their transition uh, towards uh, zero net carbon um, by 2060. Right, it's really dependent on the extraction of energy from hydropower, solar power and wind power in these areas. But I think sometimes, though, uh, it, it strikes me that that's what people, because there's because the Brahmaputra, where they're taking all this energy from, is a into um, international river, and it comes down into India. That most of the reporting and most of the ideas that people have about it in India seem to be fixated on those big hydropower projects and presenting all of the uh, dams in the whole of the Tibetan region and all of the. Um, development around, along the Yalong Pampo had been about these big dams. And I, I really wanted to kind of push back against that a little. And um, as, so there's a couple of things. There's definitely this idea of extraction, but I wanted to kind of suggest that most of this extraction is actually coming from one specific area of the Tibetan Plateau. And that's the area of the near the Brahmaputra Bend. There's a whole series of 
um, dams through the Gyatsa Canyon in that area. Um, there's the the uh, plan decided uh, described uh, two big ones that I'll get to in a, a large dam that I'll get to in a second. Um, but you also have mines in this area, and the increase the uh, Bayou and Yingqi city is doubling in size every few years. It's becoming a real base and a real focus for development in the region. This is where Xi Jinping went, uh, visited on his um, recent journey to Tibet. They have airports, there's trains, there's fast trains into this area, freeways. Um, uh, and I'll show you some tourist stuff later that is just ooh, really, even for someone coming from Queensland, which is the tourism state in Australia, I found this over the top. Um, so yeah, so through the Gyatsa Canyon, you're getting this series of cas cascading dams. And this is the area from which this clean energy in inverted commas is being extracted and sent to China. And clearly this is having a large effect uh, on the canyons within Tibet. They're focusing on extracting hydropower from the canyons. Um, the sign on here says, um, uh, in, the, in Chinese on this dam says, um, which is basically saying, this is green energy. So you've got a big, uh, um, concrete factory in the middle of a river and this is apparently green energy but there's this idea that everything that is hydro is green energy and it will get um china to net zero um hang on it's not changing for me what's going on yes there we go and yes and then this the 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 latest dams that everyone seems to be freaking out about both sides of the of the um border um the uh, dams that are going to be put in this Im immensely um, a topographically diverse region, the Yalong Sampo Grand Canyon, uh, is will be kind of an extension of that development in that one area of the Tibetan plateau of these large hydropower dams from which you can extract energy and send it down to uh, the uh, lowlands of China. And we haven't actually got the deep, this, this dam, the uh, lower Yalong Sampo development was uh, said it was going to be developed in the five-year plan that just came out, the one where you see all of those arrows going down to the big cities, but they haven't actually described the details of what's going to happen yet. There's a lot of, I've been signed up to Chinese hydropower magazines, which is something I never thought I'd do, and they have lots of images in them, but they haven't actually decided, and they've actually um, decided on what form it's going to take, but they think it's going to be three times as big or three extract three times as much energy as the Three Gorges Dam. But they've got big issues because this gorge that the Yalong Temple Gorge, which sits just north of the line of actual control between uh, the People's Republic of China and India, is also one of the most biodiverse places on the planet. Right you, at the top, it is a, it is a, an Arctic tundra, like a, a snow mountains, Namche Bar and Gyalbodi, and at the base of it is a are tropical uh, jungles. This is, they're still finding mammals in this area that they're only discovering. So it's a real problem for them trying to figure out how to manage the biodiversity with, the, um, with these massive projects. But I also want to suggest that when they put up maps of everything being um, these big hydropower dams in Tibet, they're not all the same thing. They just say this, you often see a map saying these are to, to, um, to the dams in Tibet and we're not talking about the same thing. There are also a lot of local small hydropower projects across the plateau that actually do a lot of good for local communities and, and represent a clean way to extract energy uh, from that region. Um, so the, this is some of them. The one of Gongpo is a little bit of a intermediate um, dam, but the one below, um, which I even have video. Of, oh, there's sound from it. Yeah, you go, you can hear it. Um, <laughs> is over in Nari in, in uh, Western Tibet. Um, I particularly like the steampunk one. That's another one in Kongpo down to the right. And you also have one on the Yalong Tsangpo, uh, sorry, on the Yamdokto Lake. So these are smaller projects, less impact, and they are, can deliver clean energy to local communities, which is different. Uh, yeah. um, but then you also have, uh, as well as the big hydro being extracted out, you also have um, there's a massive pro, uh, push to develop agriculture and local water um, uh, urbanization on the Tibetan plateau. So you're getting these reservoir plus hydropower dams as well, uh, which are um, a lot of them are north of Lhasa, north and west of Lhasa um, in these agricultural areas. Um, and I want to kind of suggest that even though these aren't as big a kind of hydropower deal, in some ways this 
uh, push to develop around these river systems and the, uh, develop agriculture and intensive agriculture is actually maybe a bigger problem for downstream countries than the big dams. And particularly because of this, um, it, it, you've got this idea as part of the China's ecological civilization project. Uh, what they're basically doing is trying to intensify agriculture in some parts and then seal off other areas as being nature reserves. So the Grand Canyon in the um, Yalong Sample, for example, is an area they want to seal off, not let any of the indigenous people into the region and then move those people that had been living through hunting and, and, and foraging and, and uh, low impact farming onto smaller uh, areas where they do a lot of intensive agriculture. All right, so they've, they've got this thing about pure pigs. I've been reading all of the development details and they keep saying, we're gonna push for pure pigs. They also have aquaculture. And I got sent this video, which is a bit disturbing from lakes in Tibet where they're doing mass farming of shrimp uh, that they then grind down and add to fertilizer. Um, and this is particularly weird for um, people who uh, belong to a Buddhist culture. Um, then there's also you getting this mass uh, cultivation in uh, greenhouses. And on top of that, uh, people coming up, uh, moving up onto the plateau from China, from the Chinese mainland are struggling with the lack of trees in that area and seem to be doing massive um, plantations, including sometimes uh, melting the permafrost to do that. Um, so as well as this, you also have this, there's dams that are for hydropower, dams that are for agriculture and dams that are for tourism. I mean, just tourism. There's a lot of dams being built, smaller dams around this area to make the reflections better for selfies. You know, like self, uh, when you take a selfie photo, they have certain spots all around this area where they where have dams <laughs> where you get a better reflection. So this is one of them, um, which is actually a sacred lake, uh, Pantotso, and they made a dam on the on the um, the base of it so that it ends up more uh, filled in. They've got a, a, a tourism development uh, dam and a barrage system outside of Lhasa for the same reason, to get better reflections, better images for tourists. Um, and then this tourist infrastructure is also having a big effect on the river as well. Um, so you've got, particularly over in that corner, uh, near to India, you have a um, high-speed railway that, that you can see being built on the left here that has now arrived in Ninchi and will be going all the way into Lhasa. Um, you have uh, tourism air airports, and this one up the top right hand corner, which blew my mind, um, is a RV park. Uh, five-star RV park. So you can self-drive into there. It's right on the river and then stay in a five-star resort. There's also the kind of, uh, th this is being presented as a poverty alleviation. And so you're getting the Tibetans having to perform their culture um, for many tourists from the mainland. And the last thing that it really kind of freaks me out about um, this development is that, um, and it goes back to, um, uh, what we what I was saying earlier about this link um, between sorry, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, stop. is um <laughs> I, if you're almost done then we can yes, say one it. last minute yeah yes yeah, yeah. Okay. this was the last thing I was okay say. great, the last, great. Thing, thank the you the last thing I was going to say was that this um sorry about that there was a lot um the, the, the last thing I was going to say was that there's there's also Tibet's become part of a big massive plantation project that is another way that the Chinese state is looking to get towards zero um, carbon zero and that is by doing mass plantations all over the river um, and this is said to develop this river as a kind of shield against uh, uh, sand blowing in from the west um, and but these are all kind of uh, monocultures and so this will also lead to eutrophication and changes in the um, hydrology that will also affect the river coming down into India. That's it. <laughs> Thank you Ruth. Um... We'll come back to, to some of these, but I want to then move on to Mirza. And, and I mean, broadly the same question to you as well, but I want to just highlight uh, what Ruth said about, a, it's not just about these large dams, it's about a lot of other projects that affect the river and then ultimately affect the people living um, and dependent on this river, whether you're talking about, you know, the change in ecology of the river, um, more or less silt, depending. So then that, how does that affect your agriculture? So it's uh, again, to highlight to everyone um, and all those who've joined in a bit late, um, when we talk about infrastructure that is, uh, whether affects the river and the people, uh, we need to think beyond just these large um, 
dams and these hydropower projects. So I'm, I'm really glad, Ruth, that you brought that up. Um, so if you could comment on that part as well, um, Miza, and especially to, to, to let our audience know, um, in, in some ways we, in, in India, we're very concerned about, you know, what happens to the water availability and the quantity of water uh, and that we forget to talk about, the, you know, the quality of the water and the other potential cascading effects. Um, uh, because, you know, we have a fair amount of precipitation in uh, the Brahmaputra in India itself. So it's not always just a quantity issue. Uh, so over to you, Mirza. Thank you so much uh, for your introduction and also Ruth for your setting in the context of the, you know, the um, charting out these interesting developments in Tibet. Uh, it resonates quite a lot uh, in terms of how it actually also is happening inside uh, on a downstream. Uh, in a sense of how dams for tourism, you know, uh, you know, interestingly, there were three dams which were commissioned uh, in our local, by the Arunachal Pradesh government, which were to uh, Patel Tours and Travels. Uh, three dams were being commissioned to Patel Tours and Travels in 2008. Um, so, in that sense, also in terms of monoculture, uh, monocropping, uh, palm oil cultivation is being pushed uh, rapidly in um, Arunachal Pradesh, which is one of the most biodiverse regions in, in left in India now. Um, and, and that also uh, has the potential to kind of disrupt, as you had said. Um, and what Ambika also said in terms of how we look at the larger economic connectivity, infrastructural connectivity, uh, kind of um, parameters and um, you know the development indicators that we are pushing towards actually in, in our borderlands, such as Northeast India, um, but also at the same time, how we are actually rupturing ecological connectivity uh, in, in that sense. Uh, most of these uh, large scale infrastructure projects are also going uh, against the grain of this ecological connectivity and proper environmental impact assessments uh, are missing. Um, there are certain genuinely some concerns among local communities, definitely about the dams that are being built in China. Uh, not only China, but if you look at the larger Himalayan, Himalayan region, uh, you know, uh, apart from Tibet, I think the big dams that are also coming up in Arunachal Pradesh, as well as in Bhutan, are also of concern to, you know, most of uh, the Eastern Himalayan region. And uh, downstream communities are equally apprehensive of uh, upstream uh, um, dams uh, that are built in China, but also about dams in Bhutan as well as in uh, India as well. And, and, and as to how we also look at the larger riparian connections, as Vishwaranjan is also going to speak about Begna, as to how do we again talk to Bangladesh in a larger multilateral setting. Yeah, we can say that you know China is upstream and doing these kind of interventions unilaterally, but then uh, how do we again then justify interventions in India as well as in Bhutan, uh, as by Bhutan again um, uh, on the upstream. So in that context, I, I believe that this large scale infrastructural uh, projects also has this what I call as um, in a sense, uh, infrastructural effect, uh, where most of the hydropresses, again, um, um, you know, South Asian hydropresses, um, and China uh, has a long history of its hydro hydrocratic history. Uh, it has also seen these kind of mega um, development projects and infrastructure projects as a matter of civilizational pride, national pride, and that also uh, is the same for India as well. Um, but how do we again look at rivers um, merely as taps or you know as a strategic race? Uh, and that is how it is being collectively, in a sense, also framed in a way. Uh, in, in terms of how, if we hear about this dam being built in China, then we announce another dam project in, uh, you know, uh, on the Indian side. And this kind of posturing, again, vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, you know, India and China is actually has the potential to basically, at the end of the day, uh, uh, threaten the uh, fragile ecology of the Himalayas as a whole. Uh, and, and the communities that live along the, uh, there's very many small communities that inhabit um, the uh, Himalayas uh, as a whole again. So in that sense, um, um, we have to also look at these infrastructural effects, which again, uh, set the agenda for future speculative and you know spectacular infrastructural interventions. 
for such hydrocracies again. Uh, and that also forms the basis of social, political, and ecological relations on the ground. And, and, and we not to only talk about, um, you know, uh, uh, hydropower dams, but also to talk about uh, after the 1950 earthquake, which is also known as the Great Assam earthquake, and also was originated in Tibet, um, which also changed quite the course of the river as a whole, in a sense. And, and, and how um, that kind of events also uh, are there in the larger risk uh, uh, landscape, you know, of, of these Himalayas, uh, where people have to live, commun entire communities have to live under the shadow of. Uh, so in that sense, there is a lot of infrastructuring risk in the larger ecology. Uh, and that is what is actually uh, both China uh, and India some seems to be doing in the, and as well as Bhutan, Nepal as well. So in, in that context, a lot of these countries are now actually engaged in that kind of a, uh, uh, kind of a strategic race and looking at uh, uh, these rivers as kind of more kind of a strategic tool rather than underscoring the transboundary scale. So in terms of disasters, uh, if we speak in 2000, the year 2000, there was a big flash flood on the Siam uh, as well as the Sutledge. And till today, the local people in Arunachal Pradesh call it the China Pani. You know, and they refer to that big flood as the China Pani. Uh, and even today, uh, we also have to look at disasters at a larger transboundary scale uh, and, and uh, disasters which affect communities and also how with climate change effects and impacts, how these disasters are actually growing more and more, uh, you know, uh, in intensity and also becoming more catastrophic for communities. And also, I mean, we have seen in China in the recent years as to how floods have become much more catastrophic as well as in India. In Assam also, we have seen floods becoming quite, quite big and, you know, uh, causing a lot of damage. So in the, in the recent IPCC report also, we have, it has been highlighted again as to how this climate change effects is going to um, impact the larger population in, in this region. Uh, and also just uh, as a last point, I wanted to also emphasize that we, when we talk about rivers, we or sometimes only talk about surface water. You know, also we have to also talk about groundwater. We also have to talk about monsoons and the sky rivers as we speak about, you know, as to how variations in these patterns is also a matter of quite a, a big concern. Uh, and, and how do we actually uh, tackle these challenges as we go forward uh, uh, and, and continue these conversations around ecology uh, around the Himalayas. So in the larger context, um, my framing would be to also uh, particularly look at this larger aspect as a bioregion, uh, as an alternative kind of a framing, uh, as an eco region, uh, rather than only looking at a, a kind of within the nation state boxes. Because this transboundary river basin, such as the Brahmaputra, cannot be fixed within a nation state box. So, in that sense, I would end here now, but uh, maybe I continue later. Thank you. Thank you, Mirza. Um, lots of important points. And I think we'll come back to this question of, of how do we look at it from a, a more macro um, river basin lens, as opposed to, as you say, the nation state box. Um, but over to you, um, Vishwa, and the, and the same question with a little add on here um, in that the Meghna Basin uh, is facing the brunt of what's happening in, in, in China, in, in India, and as uh, Mirza brought up in Bhutan as well. Um, so how, I mean, how is that, how is the river going to deal with that? And then the people dependent on that, um, what their perspectives as well. Um, and it's not just about then what the countries are building, but as Mirza said, changes in the climate um, and more increasing um, extreme weather events that we're seeing nowadays. Over to you, Vishwa. Thank you, Ambika. Can you see me and my slide on the screen? Yes, yes, absolutely. Thank you very much. So, hello, everyone. My name is Vishwa. And as uh, uh, Ambika introduced me, I work on the transboundary water governance issue. And I'm based in the IUC in Asia Regional Office in Bangkok. And uh, like last eight, 10 years, I have been trying to you know, understand what are the mechanisms um, at the transboundary level that can work and how we can build trust between the countries, you know, talk more about water and, uh, you know, maximize benefits from the basin. 
And before I start my conversation, like I mean, most of it is coming from one of the river basin, which is shared by Bangladesh and India. You see the map in front of you. And here in this part of the basin actually receives a bit of water from Brahmaputra, but eventually, um, you know, I mean, we can say that this basin is in independent and a little bit less complex, but contiguous to Brahmaputra. So it's like it's continuous with Brahmaputra, so not separate from it in that way, but uh, hydrologically separate because most of the water which is getting into the river uh, is, is coming from the Indian side. So, uh, you know, I mean, why this map I wanted to show you, this is a land use map of 2015. And any development, when we talk about infrastructure, dams, irrigation, it entails land use changes. And land use changes have impact. According to IPCC report, more than 25 to 30 percent of the climate uh, or the carbon, carbon or, or GHG emission uh, was due to the land use changes in the last 10 years. So these are important and we need to understand. And we need to understand these changes. Um, happening at the basin level. Because if you look at isolated case or small area of the basin, you will understand what changes are happening, but then you cannot assess how these changes are impacting the other part of the basin. So quickly describing you what the Meghna Basin is. So this is international bank boundary. Almost the basin is divided 50-50 between the two countries. And India is the upper uh, riparian, and the Barak is the main river, which goes into Bangladesh and fragments into Surma and uh, Kushiara, and then meets again. And as you can see, the Indian part of the basin, um, it's like, uh, it's rich in biodiversity. And uh, uh, as a whole, the basin supports uh, more than 50 million people, uh, the ecosystem services of the basin. Uh, but despite the richness of this basin, uh, there is no like, you know, joint mechanism between India and Bangladesh, specifically focusing at this basin, uh, and aimed at the management of the basin in an integrated way. Um, one of the important characters of this basin, you see it's very you know, primary sector oriented. So Indian side, you see green, which are a lot of forest, and the Bangladesh side is all yellow because it's full of croplands and a lot of wetlands here. So what is the dependence here in this case? I mean, if you talk about dams, there was there is some dam building activity happening here um, in the other upper part of Burak, where there is some hydroelectricity potential, but that's not a very big issue. There was an issue of the five move dam, and it's going on for the last 20 years, but it never took off. There were concerns, both at the local level and at the transboundary level. At the local level, there was concern from the indigenous people that this dam will lead to submergence and loss of ecosystem services and increased siltation down the stream. So Bangladesh was concerned that you know it will lead to control of water from the India side. And this region of Bangladesh, <clears throat> which actually is fed by the Barak River, is, uh, is, is the food basket of Bangladesh. And the, it's also very much important for the inland navigation and fishery. Uh, not navigation, fisheries. A lot of wetlands. And this receives water from Meghalaya. This is the wettest region of the world with a lot of indigenous people living in this region. So when you look at, so there was this concern from Bangladesh that the dam is built, then it will lead to changes in the flow in the wetland or the Haur region, which is this region yeah, in Bangladesh, uh, impacting their food security. So the dam has not come up. But exactly the reason was transboundary concern. If you review the literature, you will see that no, transboundary concern is not the reason uh, for, for the delay in the dam. It's because of the local people's movement. Who were there in Manipur and Mizoram? They they were really against it, and they have uh, you know made sure that the dams doesn't come up. So set that issue aside. Then there are other issues in the basin in terms of land use changes. So ninety percent of the basin's forest is in Indian side. So it's not just about infrastructure development, but see if there are land use changes. A lot of things getting this forest getting converted into plantation agriculture, which is very big in the basin in these days. What is happening is that this degradation of forest in India is leading to a lot of movement of silt in the Indian side, for which we don't have you know, any, any studies or account of it. And this has a re real, real concerns for the Bangladesh side. It increases the vulnerability to climate change. Uh, it, 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 it reduces the food security of the country. So now 
I mean, I just wanted to share this example of how you know different you know the land use changes can have a significant transboundary impact. And in this case, it's not just impacting um, uh, the India because in India there are these indigenous community. So land use changes have affected the ecosystem services and eventually their livelihoods. But there is also you know downstream impact. So what, how we can you know try and address these impacts. So IUCN is working with the stakeholder. What is happening right now is that there are some discussion on some of the transboundary river, uh, river tri or the tributaries of the Meghna Basin between Bangladesh and India on, on water sharing. So, so far, most of the dialogue is around water sharing. So our thinking is how, I mean, how as IUC in working with different partners, we can expand the scope of the, this dialogue, talk about beneficial sharing opportunities in the Meghna Basin, and uh, identify that how and what kind of uh, institutional mechanism could help us maximize the benefits and operationalize benefit sharing agreement at different levels. For, for a very like uh, simple example, what benefits can India or say the indigenous, this is, this is all the area controlled by indigenous people in India, they have the control of forest. If they do better management of the forest, there are clearly downstream benefits. What are the ways and mechanisms these benefits can be shared between the two countries? So that that kind of a strategy is what we need to think about. A strategy where both the countries have win-win, they benefit from it, all the stakeholders benefit from it, and it's sustainable. So benefit sharing as a dialogue in, 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 in case of a river basin or a shared river basin provides us that entry point to expand dialogue and think about integrated management of the river because at the end of the day, river is connected. And this approach will also help us better deal with the impacts of climate change because as you know, most of the impacts of climate change act eventually, you know, they, they manifest themselves through water, whether it's flooding or droughts or, you know, even the, so, so uh, even the erosion uh, of the river bank, siltation, these are all uh, linked. So um, this is how we need to work together, understand how benefits could be shared. And uh, in, in doing so, what countries can look towards is international water law principles of no harm, um, principles of consultation, um, data sharing, and developing, you know, small, small mechanisms. Many times, I would also like to emphasize that we talk about, you know, big agreement uh, covering the full basin. But what is required is a fragmented cooperation approach where, you know, small, small cooperation efforts between country around specific uh, themes or uh, you know actions leads to the long term trust and maybe opens the door for integrated uh, water resource management at the basin level. Uh, thank you very much. I will add to. Uh, Yeah, thank you, uh, Mishma. I'm I'm actually kind of glad that you took it in this direction, uh, which is a little bit positive as well in that there are options for cooperation. Um, I was going to ask a question about, um, uh, you know, how we can, we've seen how water insecurity and not just in South Asia, but in many uh, basins around the world can fuel or exacerbate existing tensions between countries. Uh, we've seen it within countries as well. Um, and so my question was really going to be, is do we see then um, in the future uh, infrastructure related disasters that are transboundary in nature to are they also likely then to fuel this tension that exists between countries in this region um, and what happens then when we throw variables of climate change into that mix um, but I think that the large answer to that is 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 possibly yes, though how that happens is is a bit unknown. But since Vishwa has taken it in a slightly more positive direction, I think maybe we'll I'll I'll change that question and and to see is 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 asked then all three of you again. Um, and in the meantime, then I I also invite our participants to put in any questions they have in the chat box. But till that comes, I'm gonna take this next round. Is just ask is what are 
realistically speaking, some of these um, smaller, low-hanging fruits, so to speak, that can become form the little building blocks and basis of larger cooperation. I mean, we all know uh, the TISA agreement has been sort of languishing for years now. Um, we've got some MOUs and agreements. Uh, there is uh, the uh, sharing MOU between India and China. But how do we like increase that? And it's not just then India, China and Bangladesh, right? We need to involve in certain ways, Nepal and Bhutan as well um, as part of that larger river basin. So, so from your perspective, um, what are some of the, I guess, not easy, but easier um, uh, steps that these countries um, can take. And, and and I'll come straight back to you, Vishwa, if there's um, looking at it from the, the last part of the river basin, if you want to add on a couple of points more to your presentation, and then I'll come to uh, Mirza and then Ruth. So I think we have to, I mean, if you talk about China, you have to say, see that there is there are MOUs currently between the two countries, I mean, especially uh, there is one on Brahmaputra and other on Satellite, where India gets some data and information on, you know, on, on flood management issues. And, but we have to see, there is also, there are other opportunities. This, this is like very specific MOU, but there is a joint declaration between India and Bangladesh from 2000, uh, sorry, India and China from 20. So I'm just talking a bit now about Brahmaputra and India, China. So this 26, 2006 joint declaration talks about extra export level mechanisms between the two countries, where it's not just the Ministry of Jal Shakti as a member, but the Ministry of Finance, Ministry of uh, you know, Industry, so three, four different ministries. So rather than just talking about a water platform, we have to think about a, a broader you know, platform or a mechanism which just not talks about water, but a broader economic and social cooperation between countries. Similar thing exists between India and uh, Bangladesh on the Meghna River Basin. It's not as specific to Meghna, but could be applied to Meghna or Brahmaputra or Ganges. It's the uh, uh, it's the it's the India Bangladesh uh, 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 treaty. Uh, just what I mean, there is a joint consultative committee yeah. basically, uh, which was established in the 2011 treaty between India and Bangladesh. On uh, it's a framework cooperation between India and Bangladesh. So that is also a very good mechanism because that is that GCC. Now we talk about Joint River Commission between India and Bangladesh. But what is happening is that now our friend Shawahik is also here as participant today and he can add to it that this GCC is becoming a kind of now platform where you have different ministries. It is led by the foreign ministries. What happens when you're doing dialogue and even like if, if a, a, for an organization like IUCN is trying to facilitate dialogue from outside and we work with the water ministry, it gets us stuck because it's a foreign issue. So here is a mechanism in the form of JCC and similar mechanism in case of India, China as an export level mechanisms and a 2006, which should be utilized to broaden the discussion on integrated water resource management and economic cooperation. So I think this, these are the low hanging fruits and uh, climate change also because as a, as a country, we have to understand nature-based solution. Like in case of Meghna, it really gives a case of nature-based solution. If India is doing a better forest management, there are positive benefits downstream. And you see that what a positive action can do in terms of improving the adaptation capacities of local community, just through a practice of NBH, like better wetland management or forest management, rather than changing it into something else. So doing that can actually enhance the work of, uh, local people's uh, adaptation. So these, so in, one is the like what institutions or the framework that we have, and maybe focusing on NBS as an entry point to build dialogue and expand benefit sharing opportunities. Um, super, Vishwa. Thank you. Uh, I completely agree in that. I think bringing the con the, the 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 conversation of water security into some of these other ministries is very important because they're so in as we talk about the river being interconnected, the governance of it is also very interconnected. And I think sometimes we, we forget about that. Um, and uh, so I'm glad you brought that up. Um, Mirza, over to you, if you want to add on to some of what Vishwa said, but then maybe broaden that scope. Uh, yeah, thank you, Vishwa. <clears throat> I agree with you in that sense that 
how we can take small steps and, and the diversified steps towards you know uh, gaining this kind of a uh, kind of a engagement but how we actually talk about sharing um, on a transboundary river basin uh, the dominant narrative of almost always is that kind of you know power politics and securitization it is more about you know powering than sharing waters in a sense powering waters in a sense so in that sense uh, we also have to look at how um, climate change forces us to think that conceptual map of how we look at securitization of the larger and, and the language of understanding this kind of larger transboundary spaces. Um, in that context, uh, if we take the example of China and India, uh, uh, it all started from that flash flood of 2000, the China Pani, uh, and then when the MOU was signed uh, and, and basically um, in 2002, and then led to the you know 2005 uh, population in 2006 in 2013 and, and there was a you know a kind of a incident in uh, like uh, 2017 when the Doklam standoff happened after that uh, for a whole year the data was not shared uh, between China uh, and India. Um, however, um, we also have to understand uh, that you know there is not always that uh, conflict and cooperation. Uh, amongst uh, basin riparians will not always happen one after the other. It can happen simultaneously. So in that sense, it's a simultaneous process uh, where there could be conflict at the same time there could be cooperation happening between the same countries uh, on a different issue area altogether. So that also has to be underlined very well and understood in a larger context. Uh, um, um, and, and it's a kind of iterated engagement as well. Um, uh, and how do we also see, for example, uh, we uh, see this kind of larger, uh, in 2017 again, when the waters of the Siang became uh, black and turbid, you know, there was an earthquake um, uh, upstream in, the, in Tibet. But then uh, because of lack of proper information uh, systems, uh, local communities almost actually could see cement in the water uh, because they had this larger vision of dams being built upstream, diversion canals being built upstream. So there was a larger speculation uh, overall in, in the narrative. This is a speculation that we can actually do without, mm. you know, in, in, in terms of, you know, how cooperation can happen between basin countries. Uh, and um, communities living along this river has the basic right for uh, accurate information uh, on the river basin and on the rivers they live by and on which their livelihood depends, you know, uh, and that, that is uh, of very, very prime importance. Uh, and as Vishwa was saying that, you know, uh, in Meghalaya, there are a lot of kind of traditional kind of um, um, forest uh, practices that are going on. But then now the government is again bringing in this kind of oil palm cultivation in a big way. Plantation uh, is going to be, become quite big. And how does this then the transboundary level operate and how do we then play it out? So I think uh, what I would actually then propose is also to look at the larger kind of um, uh, this whole concept of not looking at nation state interest, but uh, the river basin interest. And the river basin interest should be underlined. Uh, and uh, we can also take lessons from political regionalism to uh, underline what I wrote an article for ICS again some years back uh, on river regionalism. Can we actually look at river regionalism as a concept, um, borrowing from like the sub-regional groupings that we have in South Asia? Uh, can they be actually synergized to uh, talk more about issues related to transboundary waters, uh, which has already happened in the BCIM to some extent, the BBIN? Uh, the BIMSTEC and the SASEC, for example, um, and the TROSA is also doing great work on this. Mm -hmm. So that, that I think could be the future. We can also learn from the Mekong example, you know, and other river basins in the region uh, and, and get, get, get uh, basically this uh, going forward. Yeah, thanks. Um, absolutely, Mirza. I think uh, also a few 
very successful um, river basin sort of experiments uh, in cooperation, I would say, from other parts of the world as well, uh, from, from West Africa and Senegal. They've just recently announced a new agreement on groundwater management. Um, then if we look at uh, Europe um, and, and some of the other examples as well, I think these are also some things we need to study. Um, Ruth, uh, similar, same question to you, um, but I'm also going to add on to that from uh, one of our participants who's um, asked about, um, you know, uh, green infrastructure or ecosystem-based disaster risk reduction um, solutions. And I know you mentioned a little bit about the small um, hydropower projects that are probably more beneficial to both the people and the river. Um, so can you, if we can think of, you know, knowledge sharing in that sense um, uh, for the entire river from these ideas or any others that you might want to highlight. Uh, that question, um, sorry, sorry, Ruth, I just want to mention that that question came from Sejuti Basu um, and our audience. Yeah, thank um, you. I'm glad you said that because I was hope, I was thinking you are going to try and get me to say something positive and I was struggling, um, <laughs> struggling to think of something positive. Um, but, but that is, that is um, because I feel like there's two different conversations going on. There's a conversation happening uh, within the within China that is completely different to what is happening in the rest of um, these uh, these uh, um, the, these basins and and it's it's sometimes a bit jarring to um, think like this, that's fantastic this idea of cooperation and and working across boundaries and working out um, treaties I see it sometimes with, between um, China and Nepal they've figured out some um, uh, some co coordination but it tends to be based around um, the uh, Belt and Road Initiative, um, and also in the, um, they've done some some negotiations in the Mekong. But um, I, I honestly, the only things I ever see about India and um, uh, w like water sh sharing and working out basins is angry diatribes against India in Chinese. Right? It's like uh, um, India says we can't build this dam; they can get lost. That's basically it again and again and again. Um, but I actually think that you might be onto something with this sharing knowledge because there is a, so um, I should say that the, um, with the description of the large dam and metal at the border between uh, the line of actual control between China and India was in the section of China's five-year plan that was based on the like technological expansion and included a uh, sending um, a mission to Mars. Right, so they had this idea that this was a technological innovation, and that they're going to drive their—they're uh, going to a massive change in their economy and their politics, and in their energy infrastructure in the next. Ten, well, the finance and politics is changing now. The uh, um, energy infrastructure will be going through a massive transformation in the next ten to twenty years, and that's they're really focusing on developing the infrastructure to be able to bring that transformation about. And I don't think that sharing water or biodiversity or anything is, is, is actually part of their um, strategy. In terms of dealing with climate change, you're seeing this mitigation exercises, but also adaptation through changing the, the um, streams in the sky, like changing weather patterns. Um, you're getting silver seeding of rain patterns to try and get water into areas. And I think that the dams are seen as a way, as a insurance policy against climate change to be able to control um, these systems. And they really haven't taken into account the seismic change, uh, the, um, the, uh, un the unstable seismology of the region. But what you just said, Ambika, could work. I could see that, like through organizations like Isimod and, and these kind of um, uh, uh, knowledge sharing uh, uh, enterprises, you could get um, the sharing of micro hydro technology across the entire region so that you get like um, uh, projects that would work between uh, local groups. Because, um, because, like I said, these, there's these big projects that are all going down to the to the lowlands, but there are these little projects, and you could end up with a uh, knowledge sharing, and that is one way that you could work across this what seems to be like this impenetrable political uh, boundary uh, um, between China and India at the moment. That that's a you could do that. That's a great idea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
I'm I'm also fairly certain China would be happy to say, oh, here's our idea. Now you can all adopt it, and and this is um our plan. Uh, but uh, but I uh, but thank you. I think um, we've seen uh, some amount of this already. Uh, uh, Mirza mentioned the Mekong. Um, I've seen some amount of this knowledge sharing happening in West Africa when I've traveled in in those basins and as well as in in, in Europe and. And um, it, it sort of speaks a little bit to the question that we have, and I think that's a really important question from Divisha Srivastava um, on one, what can be done to broaden the technocratic and development centric narrative through which the rivers are seen? And she says in India and China, but I think across the region um, as a whole. And then in addition to that, how can we bring indigenous voices um, into that discussion and platform to a, understand the river better? Um, and I know Mirza has done a lot of work on this, but also then I will add on to her question to say, um, to ensure that the plans that as a country that we have for these rivers, um, take into account their understanding, um, which is, I think, very important and quite lacking in many ways. So uh, thank you, Divisha Srivastava, for that great question. Um, Mirza, I'm gonna hand that over to you first. Um, yeah, it's a kind of how, uh, as Ruth was saying, you know, in a sense, uh, kind of uh, control, um, these ministers have always tried to control with big infrastructures uh, in borderlands. And uh, to some um, commentators, it might also seem as like, you know, uh, India and China facing off with uh, dams on each side of the border as almost like military bunkers, in a way, you know, uh, uh, like as at spots uh, within these uh, rivers. Um, so, but then we are also um, making additional borders, uh, not only at the international level, but also within the nation state as well. Uh, you know, there are now uh, kind, quite a lot of outstanding issues, uh, even between communities, between Arunachal Pradesh and Assam, for example, you know, between Bhutan and Assam, between Assam and Meghalaya, uh, on sharing of uh, water resources and how these kind of their infrastructure developments are actually so at the sub-national level as well. We are actually being faced with these kind of issues. Uh, uh, sometimes it is often remarked in Northeast India Indian conference circles that it is easier to be, bring India and China to talk together than to bring Assam and Orange Buddhist to talk together on a platform. So in that sense, you know, uh, uh, you could also see how uh, you know these borders matter so much in terms of infrastructural borders, that is. Uh, but how do we bring indigenous voices uh, into the, it is by actually reframing the kind of a larger uh, understanding as to how we look at um, um, the whole, uh, how indigenous communities can hold their traditional knowledge in the face of uh, decision making on a major infrastructural process. And, and that is, is key to this, Kind of a because most of the indigenous communities who live in Arunachal Pradesh, um, uh, to what I see on the ground is that wherever there is a dam building process coming up, there is a good road that is coming up again. You know, uh, not uh, and there are bad roads where there are no dam building process. But you don't have proper access to healthcare, sanitation. You don't have proper healthcare to uh, you know edu edu education. Uh, facilities, but then you are faced with a big dam you know, in, in that kind of a uh, region. So in, in that sense, uh, we need to also uh, bring that perspective in. Uh, and uh, uh, there, there's a lot to learn also from indigenous knowledge about rivers as, you know, as they have also seen rivers moving as uh, over time. Uh, and, and modern governance systems about water, water sharing uh, across nation states and also within businesses has to also learn from indigenous communities uh, who live in, who live along these rivers and have moved as the rivers have moved and not as to try and move the rivers as uh, we want them to actually. So. Um, thank you, Mirza. Yes, I, I uh, important points and, and we've actually spoken quite a bit about how we can bring in all these diverse voices into this discussion about um, water security that's 
that's not just um, as Divisha says, um, you know, should not just be technocratic and development centric, but have that wider um, perspective. So uh, over to you, Vishwa, on this same on this same question, um, especially speaking from the Meghna Basin side, that sort of um, facing these uh, feeling these effects, um, I would say, from many many sides. Uh, yeah, uh, I think there is one 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 sentence answer to this: How you can include indigenous community and change the you know narrative? You need to establish a multi-level governance process. Sounds very simple, but it's like very complicated. But what what it means is a decentralized process where the local communities can have rights on the way they plan things at the local level and they feed the full development process for integrated river basin management. So how you can establish such a mechanism at the transboundary level, considering that there are two countries involved and many different types of governance system. With either country also, it becomes so difficult. But yes, I mean, that's how, that's, that is the direction you have to go. Um, but that is not the only thing I feel. It's also about capacity, but what we can learn from the Meghna Basin. Uh, indigenous people have the control over the land and the rivers they live in. They have their own governance. But has that solved all the problems? No. There are problems of mining. There are problems of land use changes. There are issues of capacity, finances. So even if you're giving them that decentralized system and governance participation, they're not able to you know, really effectively use it. So what is lacking? So understanding that and supporting them. Um, if you really ask me, it's about capacity and financial resources also for them. Uh, so yeah, this, these are the two things I would say. Um, great, thank you. Uh, and and Ruth, um, you know, given that China is hugely technocratic when it comes to this particular subject. So China officially has no indigenous people. Yeah, they, they say in their constitution that they they agree with indigenous rights, but no one in China is indigenous because they're all one community. So, um, but they do. That's the. I'm not agreeing with that. Like I. I viscerally disagree with it, but that's the political stance. Um, they have a uh, they have this uh, idea of minzel or ethnicities, um, and like I, that's why I wanted to start by showing that map because I think what you are seeing happening within the People's Republic of China is something that reminds me of the British Empire, <laughs> where you have a, a center and and things being taken from the periphery and dragged into that core. Um, uh, with the exploitation of these uh, minority areas and there's no voice. There's just no voice. The only thing that I saw, I remember being close to a voice and I wrote about this in, in one article was um, I, I watched Tibetan people walking across a bridge and you could see the dam on one side of the bridge and they all turned their back so they didn't have to look at the dam. That was the closest thing I saw to having a voice against the uh, types of development that were happening. And, and there's a lot of it's being done in their name um, to, uh, you know, say this is a poverty alleviation, but what it tends, and this is, a, um, a, you know, there's a lot of propaganda about the Tibetans being, having been um, taken out of poverty, but the, uh, um, the, the way that that's being done is, is, has been so technocratic. There is no, um, there is, they have no voice in that matter. No, there's, it's the opposite of what you're describing <laughs> in uh, the Magno Basin. Sorry, I couldn't be positive. No, I think I think this is a reality that we need to be aware of. Um, and I think then the, it, it comes up to the question which uh, which many ask is is it perhaps then time for uh, some of the other uh, countries uh, and the neighbors along this river to, I don't want to say band together, but come together um, in, in some format for some of these small areas of cooperation that's possible to then um, move to the next stage to involve China. I mean, it's it's one way of doing it. It's, uh, it's a little bit about how the Mekong did it. Um, I mean, if we look at China and, and how they uh, share water, uh, it's 
it's largely not much in terms of agreements and, and water sharing, um, except for a, a little bit with their agreement with Kazakhstan on, on a shared river over there and a couple of their northern na uh, um, neighbors. So, but by and large, they don't do this, but but th that in, in a sense shouldn't stop the rest of this, um, the countries from, from moving ahead. And I think both Visha and uh, Mirza have given some excellent suggestions. Um, I'm gonna say to any, um, people in this panel who might, uh, in this audience who might be listening, who have the ability to put this into action. Um, let's, uh, let's go for that. But I'm going to ask another yeah. ex question. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. One thing, like, I mean, we always talk about China and it is a like big elephant in the room and difficult because they have different governance system. It's not just about Tibet or Tibet is the source of all the rivers, but it's, it's the same governance system and a strategy all over the China. Uh, uh, which is like, I mean, which needs to improve, of course. Uh, but what you see, like, let's see. So you have banding of all the countries together to put pressure on China. They have done it for the Mekong River, you know, lower Mekong countries coming together, forming the MRC. And then did it help a lot? No, at least. But there, has, there is a, a joint voice for the countries. MRC is not fully, you know, functional or, or it's not the perfect thing, but mm -hmm. it is something there, but something is better than nothing. But what happened is that China created their own Lanchan uh, Mekong Commission. So a parallel commission. So I don't know how that relationship is working now. But in this kind of a scenario, also one very interesting example that I see where civil society or the academic sector has been contributing to what is happening. Data is not being shared, but I don't know how many of you have heard about the eye in the sky. Uh, this is a GIS-based, uh, 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 you know, tool which is developed by the Stimson Center, and they actually, using the GIS data, they predict and they see that how much water is stored in China. Those information is not coming uh, in, but through GIS technologies, they are kind of able to tell that this much extra water was removed, or this time, uh, lower Mekong region might affect more drought because we see a lot of you know activity in China where they're filling the dams. So in such a scenario also, there was this one organization which found a way to still get the data out. And that's exactly what we have to do. Getting the data out in public, influencing public. So even the government is not agreeing, maybe through the public influencing and participation things to change. And that's the best I think we can hope for now. Great, great, thank you. Um, I have another question here from Avli Varma, um, who asks on uh, interventions that are happening on sediments, for example, from dredging. Uh, large scale dredging is proposed, probably ongoing, she says, uh, between India and Bangladesh for protocol routes for navigation. Uh, I know, Vishwa, you touched a little bit on this already, uh, but I'm going to see, ask Mirza and Ruth if they had something more to add, and then I'll come back to you, Vishwa, on this question, especially given the discussion right now that's happening on um, inland waterways in uh, uh, Bangladesh as well, um, and then between some of the other countries in the region. What kind of infrastructure are we going to see in that space? And then what are the possible cascading effects um, likely? Um, which then adds on to what Ruth had earlier said, that it's not just only about the large hydropower dam building projects, but lots of these other projects that we're going to see along the river. Um, so Mirza, you want to take this first? Uh, yeah, in a sense, uh, there are different kinds of technological lock-ins, as you know, someone said, in, in terms of that comes in the life of uh, uh, this kind of interventions, you know. Uh, one is the building of embankments uh, uh, all through river systems, you know, and the unscientific way that these sometimes are built. Uh, without properly studying the river system properly, the floodplains, um, uh, how do you lay a kind of a maze of embankments? Uh, similar to uh, also with dam building infrastructure coming in, uh, without proper you know uh, environmental impact assessments being done for both upstream and downstream, uh, and the basin wide impacts, um, and that also then comes in this whole this paradigm of dredging as well, and and as to how you know. Uh, certain things that also say that, you know, we will take out, dredge out all the material and build super highways along the river and all of that. And, you know, it sounds very fanciful, but then how much of, you know, damage that you do to the biota of the riverbed 
uh, is not properly studied in that sense. Uh, and so in uh, what my understanding is that that the Brahmaputra River Basin is a very largely understudied river, uh, under-resourced river. Uh, and more uh, resources should also be allocated rather than uh, to actually study the river system uh, uh, instead of actually more resources that is being presently given for interventions on the river without studying them. That is the way at the core of how we need to look at navigation. Definitely, we need to have this kind of sub-regional cooperation on economic cooperation and all of that. But how does these dredging activities and also the navigation activities that is going to happen, uh, uh, how much of that uh, impact will that happen on the biota? Uh, how much of that? And it has been uh, also there are other studies uh, which have been done. And I think uh, navigation is a very good example as to how that. I think Mirsa would also like to share some of his insights from his work on navigation through uh, his uh, organization. Uh, but yeah, so that, that is what we have to underline. Uh, as to how much of that impact, you know, uh, that, you know, flood protection, flood management, you said dress the river and flood, but in such a highly kind of sediment load river, such as the Brahmaputra, uh, you know, how, how do you, you dredge one year and the next year it will again come back, you know, and similar with sand mining, you know, that is again boulder mining, you know, I had recently gone to Bhutan and um, uh, on the border of Bhutan, you know, there are so many rivers coming up. All these uh, boulders, uh, river bo riverbed boulders are being uh, quarried from the riverbeds of Bhutan, transported through India and taken to Bangladesh for uh, you know construction pro projects downstream. But later on, when there would be a more kind of this uh, riverbed boulders actually provide a natural cushion to flash floods. So when this kind of um, you know uh, extra flash floods will come in in the future. It will be the same downstream projects that are being built will be affected, you know. So it is uh, just to highlight one example of how this kind of uh, extraction and um, un un unstudied kind of interventions can have a also a transboundary effect uh, later on. Yeah, thanks. Um, Mishra, you want to add on to that? Or? Could you please repeat like exactly what you asked? I was like listening. Um, the question was on um, interventions on sediment, for example, large scale dredging that is proposed between India and Bangladesh for protocol routes for navigation. But as Mirza said, you could also then touch on the larger um, questions of what is likely to happen um, from the different forms of infrastructure that we'll see for you know inland navigation for example i mean uh, when we discuss about the meghna there is always this discussion on the a lot of silt coming in the whole region from the you know indian side which is a natural phenomenon but there is a sense that it has increased and it is like really destroying the ecology the wetland ecology so it is linked to forest but what but there is not much work which has happened in indian side they frankly i mean i was with the like the government officials and they presented how they are also doing some analysis of silt uh, movement, but within India, and they have some information on that, but not very willing to share all that. I mean, whatever they have, so information sharing and keeping those kinds of information is public is not happening, and not much work on sediment management as such. What is happening is just getting the outs, getting the sediment out of the navigation routes to make them navigable or better navigable. So. If you talk about silt management, that is not happening. Only dredging is happening. So I don't know of any example at the transboundary level where countries have tried to discuss and you know uh, approach this problem together. Uh, in the Meghna Basin, we are trying to build an argument around cooperation for silt management. So let's let's see. So, but no no example that I know of so far. Ruth, I see you nodding along. Um, nodding and also thinking that I wish I knew more about this. I, I mean, for, for start on the Yalong Sample section of this river, there is no navigation. So I was thinking, yeah, it, everyone goes across it, but there is very much trying to keep the sand in place is the only way I can think I'll describe it. So Mirza is saying about fanciful riverside freeways, they're there. <laughs> All the way up and down the river, there are fanciful free. there's massive 
uh, you know, eight lane freeways coming out of Flasa along the riverbed. Um, there, there, there's and and they're all there's uh, tunnels through the mountains between the Lhasa River and the Alansampo River, and they're dredging the river, the sand from the river exactly there to make the cement that they're putting into the roads right next to the river. Um, and then this is why I have those images of the plant of the the willow plantations as well, because this feeds into China zero carbon. Um, program um, but I don't know and I'm trying I keep asking sedimentologists and they're giving me different answers what happens when a river that has as much sediment as the island sample going into the Brahmaputra is has massive plantations all over it um, how does, does that affect the flow of sediment I'm guessing they're doing it not just to make it prettier for tourists but also to try and stop some of the sediment flow into the dams um, but um, are there, it's a bit kind of um, obtuse about the, the information about it. Um, I've read scientific reports about it and they contradict each other um, and experts can't tell me what's going on. So, yeah, I can't help you if they can't help me. <laughs> fair, fair enough. And, and, and it speaks to what Mirza was saying, right? We know so little about these rivers in, in reality, um, not just of what's happening today, but what's likely to happen in the future um, if we talk about all the plants that are in, in, in the pipeline in, in China, in India, in Bhutan, in uh, uh, Bangladesh, uh, when it comes to, to hydropower, when it comes to um, infrastructure, when it comes to road building activity. Uh, I mean, do we really need eight lane highways, for example, along all these, all these rivers? Um, when it comes to navigation now. So, so when, I, when I started this panel, um, and I'm also mindful of the fact that we're running out of time. So um, I'm going to say that when I started this panel, we were talking about the transboundary effects of like infrastructure development. But I think it's, it's been really great because the, um, I've learned so much. And, and I think our audience has also realized that when we talk about infrastructure development on or along a river, it's not just that one um, aspect but it's all these different aspects and um, and as you've rightly read, said, Ruth, we need uh, more information from the sedimentologists. Uh, we need more information from everybody who's connected, working on the river, understanding and studying this river. And I know Mirza has has repeatedly written about about how we need, um, you know, the you need the scientific community, you need the engineering community. Obviously, you need the people who are working on climate change, um, people like Vishwa who are working on the wetlands um, and sediments and. And, and I'm not even sure who else, uh, but but lots of other experts uh, to come together so that our understanding of these basins is really enhanced as much as possible. Um, so with that, I'm going to come back to all three of you. Um, and I'll start with you, Ruth, because you began the entire conversation right at the beginning. Um, for any last minute closing thoughts um, or, or comments or fantastic ideas that uh, we can hopefully employ in this region. Um, and, and one minute uh, to all of you um, to, for final, final comments. Sure, I, I think we should go back to your plan for sharing a micro hydropower projects. I think that's a great idea and a way to, um, uh, to build a community across boundaries. I also don't think people should give up on China. Um, China isn't just one government, it's one point four billion people and they're quite amazing and wonderful. Um, so if we can have people to people relationships, that would be a great idea. And the other thing um, uh, I would like to say that's positive about China, which I don't always do, is that, that some of the things they're doing on climate change are quite extraordinary. So um, uh, knowledge sharing, some of the uh, adaptions for uh, mitigation and adaption to climate change between India and China could work really well too. Um, thank you, thank you. Uh, Mirza? Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, it's slowly getting dark here in Assam now, and uh, just uh, you could see the light fading behind me. Um, but what we also uh, see uh, in terms of how uh, the importance to look at alternative approaches uh, is to also emphasize on community and climate science engagement. And that, that is also very, very important. Uh, and what I also mentioned a bit before, is the bioregional understanding of this planetary geography, in a sense, um, as an approach uh, to help desecuritize the dominant narratives that are on transboundary river basin. And, and for example, the Himalayas as a bioregional construct, and not only one Himalaya, but there may be many Himalayas, as someone, one of my friends says. Uh, uh, 
and and, and geographically understanding Himalayas and ecologically too, uh, and and that can lead to a cooperation at a different level involving communities as well. Uh, the Sundarbans could be also be another bioregion uh, as a sensitive bioregion uh, uh, that we you know we could bring in cooperation between India and Bangladesh. Uh, and I think that there are already many initiatives underway. So um, that that I think is the basis of how we need to move forward. Uh, Vishwa. Thank you. Thank you. I think everyone has said uh, and nothing else. But if uh, the final point that I have to highlight, if you have to understand the impact of infrastructure, look at the land use change changes mm -hmm. at the basin level and how those changes are interacting with each other and what potential impact would be. Like Ruth was saying, you are making uh, roads on the river beds. So again, example of land use change. You are making a lot of forest to think, I'm mean, thinking about, you know, controlling the silt, but you don't know if there are also other impacts, less silt might be having some impact um, down the stream. So land use changes at the basin level as a planning tool, uh, understanding that could be a very uh, good entry point. And then when you're talking about transboundary uh, basin management, how we can develop, promote the development of mechanism at different levels among different stakeholders to expand the understanding and a scope of benefit sharing um, of different types of benefit sharing among the stakeholders at the basin level and how they can cooperate and work with each other to you know, maximize the benefit. And at the end, I think I will again emphasize on this fragmented joint action approach because we are not in the stage where we can have a basin-wide interaction or long-term engagement. But if we start one by one, then it will build trust and maybe we'll reach a point where we have a framework, basin-level frameworks agreed by different countries in the future. Um, absolutely, uh, thank you. And if I may add um, one more uh, uh, to point to what all our um, excellent panelists have said is um, knowledge sharing from within um, the region and uh, the countries here, but also um, I think a, a study of what has happened in other river basins that have had tensions between them, but have sort of gotten past or figured out this conflict cooperation balance. Um, why not we look at some of those best practices, understand what to do, or in some cases, what not to do also, um, and how can we learn from their experience, I think would be super uh, beneficial to the region over here. Um, so with that, I must say thank you to everyone. Um, thank you to our audience for um, attending and staying in this afternoon on Wednesday. Uh, once again, to let everyone know, the Institute of Chinese Studies has a, a seminar every Wednesday, and they're all such amazing topics. So please do register and attend. Thank you very much to Ambassador Kanta and um, the Institute for allowing us at the Kubernetes Initiative to uh, put together this panel for uh, this Wednesday's uh, seminar. And most of all, um, I want to say thank you to my team, uh, Animesh Jain and Adya Shah, who I know are in the audience um, and uh, have been really helpful in getting all of this done. And um, most importantly, thank you to uh, our ex Excellent panel members. I would have loved to continue this conversation. Um, the great part about these Zoom events is that we can bring people from all over the world um, and put them together and have these great panels. But the downside to these Zoom events is that now I can't say, come, let's go have coffee in the, in the side room and continue this discussion. So uh, I feel like we need to find some balance um, between uh, these, uh, these and so hopefully I will meet all of you at some point in the future in person. Um, so thank you very much, Mishwa, Ruth, and Mirza for being here with us so on this event. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for much. organizing it, thanks. It was completely a good fun and learning experience.